is part four of this really wonderful series in Designing Your Destiny, Making the Most of My Mind. You know, I, I have the privilege of teaching at Regent University, and we say a mind is a terrible thing to waste. And we love to teach students from 18 to 80. And when you have a love for learning, it's, it's, just, it's just a zest for life. And one of our slogans at Regent is faith and reason. And the reason for that is, isn't to be redundant, is that one of the definitions of hell is the absence of reason, the inability to sort of figure things out and make sense of life. And also, too, if you think about it, going back to the foundation of our democracy, we teach government. Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, they said there are two things that are absolutely essential for a functioning democracy. The first is education. The second is religious morality. They go together. And, and so in our Christian walk, we have to develop our mind. It's a major part of our spiritual job description. And the truth of the matter is, God gave us this beautiful brain, this wonderful computer, and it can learn at all ages. If we stop learning, we really stop growing. But of course, you know, today, learning is not easy. You know, again, part of the problem is there's so much to learn out there. And all of us, even, again, in the academic world, no matter where you're at, there's sometimes we're a mile wide and an inch deep. You've got the Internet, and, 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 and it was easier in some ways learning 200 years ago because they had less to learn. They focused on the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. And just to give you an example of this, even among college students, they did this poll recently in Fox News, and actually, 10% of the students thought that Judge Judy was an actual member of the Supreme Court. <laughs> and their show was real. You know, it's, it, it, That goes to show you that even among the, supposedly the college educated, you know, we need some remedial learning. We talk about the three R's. And I'm going to try to just hopefully just further in, inspire you to love learning. Because see, one of the greatest gifts that God gave us is learning. The ability to discover truth about God's great creation, his nature, beauty, this world that we have. And I'm sorry, folks, if you don't like to learn, you won't like heaven <laughs> because we're going to spend eternity loving and learning more about God's infinite nature that we'll never completely under, understand. And then there's a scripture passage on your screen here that really reflects that, the Apostle Paul. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of the, all the fullness of God. That's true in this life, and it's true throughout eternity. So now we, we turn to the outline. First uh, bullet, why should we make the most of our mind? <laughs> because it is a foundational part of the great commandment and the great commission. It should say Luke 10.27 in your, your bullet. It actually says 12, but it, it should be Luke 10.27. Luke 10.27 is the great commandment. Jesus speaking, he said, he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. It's a great commandment because it all begins with love, and we love Jesus, and we love God with all of us. All of us. And see, the thing about it is, when you get this commandment right, then you're qualified to do the next part. You can change the world by being a disciple. And that's the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. See, it's just not about converts. It's not just about having a little bit of knowledge. You need to know Jesus intimately. And when you know Jesus intimately, you have the power of God to change the world. Jesus taught the masses, but he discipled a few. So you see, it was the twelve. Then the 12, like 70, and then it grew to 120 at Pentecost. And after Pentecost and the Holy Spirit, 3,000, and now it's billions. 
that's what disciples do. They pass it on. They change the world. And then point two, it really goes back to the Garden of Eden. It's all part of our spiritual job description. Using our mind and learning was part of our original spiritual job description to tend the garden and to name the, the animals. And see, we were made as learning creatures to discover truth about God's great creation, the good and the beautiful things. We talk about the dominion mandate, which is Genesis 2.15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work and take care of it. Now, in order to work and take care of anything, you need knowledge, you need wisdom, you need to use your mind. And then Genesis, 19, uh, Genesis 2, 19, 20, which is on your screen, further reinforces this. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. That's God. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. In essence, it's a form of science. It's a form of biology. It's a form of taxonomy. So from the very beginning, we were charged with using our minds. And this leads to point three. We learn, we have to learn to love learning by entering the kingdom of God as a little child. Matthew 18, three on your outline. And Jesus talking, and he said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. That's important. See, wh wh why are kids such great examples of this? Children have minds that are a little like vacuum cleaners and little computers that just love to be programmed from the very beginning. And again, when I, my kids were young, I, as an educator, I always liked this question, Daddy, why? <laughs> Mommy, why? And sometimes it may drive you crazy, but that's the childlike faith and, and, and just the, the and joy of, and the love of learning. And so... As we have to take that same attitude. What Jesus is really saying here, too, is that we have to have that love of learning like a child. But of course, we need the right teachers. It's important to have the right teachers. And so there's a flip side of this, too. Just like that little child, we need to learn to trust God when we don't understand, when we don't, and we can't figure it out. I'm going to give you a silly example of this just to reinforce this. I, uh, how many of you have cats at home? A few of you. That's good. Well, I love cats. I love dogs, too, but we just have cats. One of our cats, her name is Pumshi, and she's just really high strong. So anytime she, she, she gets ready to go to the vet, she freaks out. She sees the cage. She'll hide. It'll take us an hour to get her. And then when we get her in the cage, she's just, like, scratching and howling, and so, like she's being killed and, and maybe skinned alive. It's, 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 it breaks my heart. But I got to do it, right? I have to take her to the vet. And when she gets to the vet, Pumshi doesn't really understand what's going on. To her, the, the veterinarian is what? The devil. <laughs> it's, and, and there's people here with like things to torture. She doesn't realize that those things are really things to help her, right? Uh, whether it's immunizations or clipping her claws or whatever, whatever's going on. And, I, and again, I'm not trying to, you know, make this uh, you know, amusing in the sense it's for us, but see, when we go life through life's trials and tribulations, we have to trust God. Because we, we don't really understand. We can't see the big picture. God is playing four-dimensional chess. <laughs> the past, present, and future. And so unless we learn how to trust like a little child, we miss so much of what God has for us. He wants us to use our mind, but there's also a limit. And that's called a paradox. So much of the kingdom of heaven is a paradox. To, to gain your life, you've got to lose it. Sometimes to learn, we also have to basically learn how to uh, sort of accept the fact we, we can't know. But we have to trust God. See, that's the learning part, using your mind. Romans 8, 28, all things produce good for those who love God and call according to his purposes. Point four, learning is a lifelong process of renewing our mind. As we learn more about our loving God, we need the three R's to rebut lies. And what I'm talking about here is, is that Romans 12.2, and I'll talk about the three R's. But Romans 12.2, on your outline, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. See, the world is trying to program us. The devil's trying to program us. 
our flesh is trying to program us. So there's like these three sources that are just warring to control your mind. And so it's, we have to, as a Christian, we have to get rid of the old programming, delete it and replace it with, with the Lord's. That's where the three R's come in, in terms of spiritual warfare. So the first R, again, is simply is to rebut. So when you get a thought that is not of the Lord, this, let's take an example here. You, know, you get sick, and all of a sudden you start to have you know, these thoughts, you're, you know, you're going to die, or I'm never going to get well. You have to rebut those thoughts. You rebut them with the Word of God. Jeremiah 29, 11, for example, I know the plans that I have for you, for good and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Isaiah 54, 17, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. And after you rebut it, you replace it with healing scriptures. With the stripes of God, with the stripes of Jesus, I am healed, Isaiah 53, 5. And then you repeat as necessary, as many times as you have those thoughts. I mean, that's the nature, you know, of our spiritual warfare battle. That's one of the ways that we renew our minds. And Jesus demonstrated this when he was tested in the wilderness. When he was at his weakest point, after fasting for 40 days, Satan came to him and said, if thou be the son of God, turn these stones into bread. And Jesus didn't argue with him. He rebutted it and says, basically, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so we need to do that as well. And that leads us to point five. Learning under the direction of God produces wisdom or the ability to make sensible life choices. You'll see up on the screen here, there's like some fancy terms we use in theology. One of them is orthodoxy. See, the thing is, if you're going to be wise, you have to believe and know the right things. Hosea 4.6 says, my people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. And Proverbs 1.7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And again, I know, Lord, I've been foolish, and we're all foolish at different times. So we have to believe and know the right things, and, and that then, then we have to put it into practice. That's orthopraxis, James 1.22. Do not really listen to the, wor to the word, and so deceive yourselves, but do what it says. So it's just like this. I may know that exercise is good for me, but I'm a practical atheist if I don't put it in, into application. The same thing, you know, in terms, again, if you know that you're supposed to forgive, but we don't do it. You know, we're being a practical atheist as a Christian. We're not being a hearer and a doer. And, and we're all, you know, guilty of that at one time or another. Then point six, we need both Hebraic and Greek or heart and head learning to produce wisdom. The Greeks basically like to learn through programs, you know, through uh, learning principles and practices. The, he the Hebraic method was a little bit different. If you would go into a synagogue in the first century, it was much more communal much more kind of a, a group-based thing. But the truth of the matter is, you have to learn things at the head and heart level. Jeremiah 31, 33 on your outline. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. So let's uh, uh, give an example of this in practice. Uh, Matthew 12, 9, 14. Uh, was a powerful example of this on your screen. See, Jesus, one of the things he, he, would, he would call the Pharisees out because they didn't learn properly. They had the head knowledge, but they didn't have the heart for God. And this illustrates this. Uh, going on from that place, he, Jesus, went into their synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus, they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? He said to them, if any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath because the Pharisees were accusing Jesus again of breaking the, the commandment on the Sabbath. But Jesus turned it around him and said, listen, you have head learning but you don't have heart learning. The heart here is, is that if you have an opportunity to do good and to relieve somebody's suffering or to, you know, to, to help improve somebody's life, do it on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out and was completely restored, just as sound as the other. But the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. And so one of the ways that we know that we're just basically stuck 
on the letter or the head is that you know we, we become rigid in how we learn and how we think. And then point number seven. Godly learners filled with the Holy Spirit produce disciples that teach others as we learn to become more like Christ. See, the thing is, as I mentioned, disciples change the world with God's power. Jesus modeled this. If you're a true disciple and you're learning, you want to give it away. Jesus and John, at the end, said to, to, the, to the disciples in the church, you're going to go out and do greater things. And see, this is one of the ways you know, we know we're making progress when it isn't about us. So again, I really want my students to do better and more than I did. And you see this in Scripture. But it, it, you still all have to have the right teacher. John 14, 26 on your outline. And the teacher, of course, is the Holy Spirit. Jesus needed the Holy Spirit when he was on earth. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I've said to you. And the truth of the matter is, for me, I didn't really start to understand the Bible and really learn it until I was filled with the Holy Spirit. I was a Christian, I was a saved Christian, but I, I didn't really have the, the indwelling Holy Spirit on a regular basis. And so the Bible really never meant, uh, made a lot of sense to me until I really surrendered to the Lord. And then the Bible starts to come alive, almost like it's just jumping out of the pages in the, in the words. But this notion of discipleship is so embedded in the Old Testament and the New Testament, a 2 Kings 2.9, which is on your screen. This is the story of Elijah and Elisha, two of the great prophets of the Old Testament. And Elisha was Elisha's uh, ment it was mentee. He was being mentored by Elijah. And this spirit of actually going out and do greater things is illustrated in this scripture quote. It says, they had crossed the Jordan River there. Elijah said to Elisha, tell me what I can do for you before I am taken from you. Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. And what's interesting is if you count the number of miracles that Elisha did, he did twice as many miracles as Elijah. And that was by design because that's what disciples do. Another great example of this in scripture is Paul and Timothy, one of the great teacher-student love stories. In fact, this scripture passage, 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, is above the doorway of the admin building at Regent. And it says, All, And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust the reliable people who also be qualified to teach others. So this is, we're called to learn it using our minds and pass it on. Now, I'm going to start moving this to conclusion here by talking about some of the things that cause us to not learn well. And really, it's a five-letter word called pride. <laughs> pride is one of the most powerful enemies of godly learning. Proverbs 16.8. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. And there's kind of three things that you, you shouldn't do with your mind. The first, and I was guilty of this, was making your mind a God. Exodus 23. What's the first commandment? You shall have no other gods before me. It goes back. The original sin of Adam and Eve. Why was it so serious? Ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the reason was is that what they were saying by definition is, is that I can do this better than you, God. I want to define what's right and wrong. I want to define what knowledge and truth is. And of course, when we do that, we replace God. And only bad things, you know, come from that. And so that's why it's important to understand that we make our mind to God through science and technology. We worship the created things rather than the creator. I was an atheist growing up. And my, part, of my, part of my gods was science. I wanted to be a meteorologist. But again, science without the creator ultimately fails us. And then we also uh, rebel through atheism. You know, I was an atheist. I was angry at God. I didn't want accountability. And of course, I was foolish, and I learned my, my lesson. But Psalm 14.1 says, fool, only a fool in his heart says there's no God. And then there's also stubbornness. So you can be a Christian, but still want to do things your way. And I've, how many of you remember Frank Sinatra and who Frank Sinatra is, right? It may have most of you, right? He's great, one of the great singers from the 40s, 50s, 60s. But one of his, uh, his, his songs he had, I want to do it my way, right? Yeah. And that's really the theme song for many of us, right? We just want to do it our way. And there's a way that seems right to a man but leads to death. And ultimately, that's the fruit 
uh, when we do things our way. Then another way we, we go astray is focusing on our selfish desires. Romans 8.6. 8, 6. 8, 6. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. You know, I wish learning, you know, wasn't difficult. The truth is, like my students, you know, if you're going to get good grades, you've got to study. You've got to put the time in. But today, there's so many ways that we can distract ourselves from learning. It's interesting, even the statistics on this. Going back 30 or 40 years ago, uh, we, we basically had, more, most people were reading books every year. But today, 25% of folks don't re haven't read a single book all year. And part of that is, is that we're, you know, we're reading stuff on the internet. But the internet still is no substitute, really, for a good classical book. So it's, it's just too many ways of getting distracted. And finally, we can use our mind for evil. This goes back to the Tower of Babel, Genesis 11:6, And the Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language they can have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. See, there's certain things that we can do with our minds because God has given us free will. We can create great things, atomic energy, space travel, biotechnology. But the real challenge is, is that do we have the character? Do we have the strength to use it wisely? And oftentimes the answer is no. And so... All right, what's the, what's the answer to pride? It's always humility. Humility is the kryptonite to pride. And so what I want to do is, is give you some tips in terms of how we teach students at Regent how to think critically, but in a godly way. When I when I say critically, I'm not talking about negatively. I'm talking about systematically. The first thing you got to do is to test your beliefs. You have to test your beliefs because... Our human tendency is to think we have all the answers. 1 John 4, 1, which is on your screen. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And so what James was, was really, was, what John was, was, excuse me, John was saying, you know, we just can't take things on their face value. You know, we have a tendency to think, you know, we're the one who knows. But there's a lot of false prophets out there. And that leads us to, to point B. You have to assume the courtroom perspective of proving innocence. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, the Apostle Paul demonstrated this because, again, our tendency to think we're right, we, we, we skew how we process information. And on the screen, you'll see a scripture passage that's not taught very often, but is very, very important. My, uh, 1 Corinthians 4.4. 4. My conscience is clear, but that doesn't prove I'm right. It is the Lord himself who will examine me and decide. So here's your thing. You know, even if you have a clear conscience and you think you've got it figured out, you, there's always an element of some uncertainty here, and this is where you need humility. Why do we assume in our system of justice innocent until proven guilty? Because it requires a higher standard of proof to convict somebody. We, we'd rather have a system where there are more errors. In other words, we don't want to convict innocent people. See, if you were in communist Russia, Soviet Union, or in any totalitarian system like Nazi Germany, when the state charged you, they assumed you were guilty. <laughs> and you had to prove your, your innocence. And that is a much you know, higher standard of proof. And so that's the way we have to do it. So I, I, we tell our students, I hope you're all anti-abortion, but you still have to understand the pro-choice arguments. So you need to put yourself in the place of others and challenge your beliefs. Because what happens is, is that once we make a decision, our brains subconsciously filter information. We are out there seeking things that confirm what we believe, and we discount information that contradicts. And that's why it takes a lot of negative information to change our minds. And so it's a deadly, uh, deadly uh, kind of way of thinking. That's why the Apostle Paul had an open mind, point C. This is a great scripture passage that's on your screen. This was uh, Paul evangelizing. Though I am free and belonging to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, so as to win those under the law. You see a pattern here. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. 
I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in his blessings. Now, Paul was not being wishy-washy. What was he doing? He was humbling himself and saying, if I'm going to witness and evangelize to folks in a credible way, I need to understand them. I need to understand what they believe. I need to understand how they think. It doesn't mean you endorse it, but it means you have the humility to put yourself in the place of another person. And then D, you got to seek advice from trusted and credible counselors. Uh, wisdom for many counselors is essential. Proverbs 15:22. But you need the right counselors. And then another one, of course, is removing the log from your eye. See, the thing about it is Matthew 7, 5 is wonderful. That's where Jesus is saying, you know what? You, know, you think you've got it all figured out, but unless you've taken the log from your eye out first, you can't see clearly. And so this is one of the things when we train managers, we say, you know what? If you really want to de-escalate conflict in a situation, you have, to, you, you, you have to take accountability for what your contributions are to the problem. So we say, you know what? Think about whether it's 5% my fault or 95%. As a leader, I've got to take responsibility for that first. Because when you do that, it disarms the conflict situation. It demonstrates your good faith. It demonstrates your humility. But a great example of this in Scripture, when we don't do this, see, our tendency is this. When we are wronged, we want justice for the other person. But when we make a mistake, what do we want? Grace, forgiveness, cut me a break. And you'll see this in this scripture passage, not on your screen, but you can look it up. Matthew 18, 21 through 35, and I'm just going to kind of paraphrase it. It's the parable of the unjust servant. There was a king who represented God, and there was a servant under him who represents us. That servant owed the king more money than he could ever repay, and that represents our sin debt. Eventually, the king says, pay up. So, of course, the servant can't pay, so he's panicked. He just throws himself before the king and says, King, king, please have mercy. Be patient. And I'll pay you, you know, uh, you know, over time. And the king looked at him, really, this is thinking in, in his mind. So, you know what? He can't pay. But I like his spunk. I like his humility. So what am I going to do? I'm going to forgive his debt. And that's God erasing our debt. It's his grace. Now, what was the response of that, of that servant? Well, that servant had a servant, who, who, a fellow servant who owed him money. And what did he do? That fellow servant fell before him and said, please forgive me, I will uh, you know, pay you. And you know what that ser wicked servant did? He picked him up by the neck and threw him in prison. <laughs> and so once the king found that out, he said, pulled that, that wicked servant and said, listen, I forgave you. You should have forgiven him. Because you haven't forgiven him, I'm, pulling, I'm, I'm basically reinstituting your debt and throwing you in prison. And see, that's another example. God calls us to forgive. He can't fully forgive us until we learn to forgive others. So again, remove the log from your eye and admit when you're wrong. And then finally, learn from all sources. There's a scripture passage that's really in the Old Testament. It's kind of humorous. It's, it's Numbers 22 through 21 through 39. Numbers 22 through 21, 39. It's Balaam and the donkey. Now, Balaam was an Old, Old Testament prophet. There was a king who was at war with Israel. And this king wanted uh, Balaam to curse Israel. He was losing every battle. Balaam needed the money, so he agreed. But of course, you know, Balaam should have re recognized that in Scripture it says, if you curse Israel, you will be cursed. So Balaam gets on his donkey. They're going towards Israel. And then three times, angels with flaming swords got in the way of the donkey and stopped the donkey. For some reason, the donkey saw it, but Balaam didn't. And Balaam started beating the donkey. After the end of the third time, then God allowed the donkey to speak. The donkey said, why are you beating me? Don't you see these two angels with flaming swords are trying to stop you? If you're not, you're going to be killed. Then his eyes were opened. And so here's the lesson for us, you know. We're all going to be stubborn at times, but there's, God is going to put some talking donkeys in our path, right? And you better listen, <laughs> And so, and we can learn, see, the lesson is we need to learn from all sources, from donkeys, from kids, you know, from older people, 
If you're the uh, CEO, you learn from the janitor. That's why I like the movie, I mean the uh, TV show Undercover Boss. It really humbles managers. Then finally, how do we just try to tie this all together? Well, I, I'm really trying to encourage you like any, any professor. <laughs> I'm going to say give you an assignment, but I'm not going to grade it. But the idea is, is on the honor system, I urge you to make an action plan to learn and develop your mind with smart goals. You don't have to make a lot. You can just make one. But I urge you to make one smart goal for this upcoming year. What is a smart goal? Well, a, a smart goal is a goal that's specific because if it's too general, you know what? You know, you're not, if I say to say, well, I'm going to exercise, that doesn't necessarily, it's not helpful. Specifically, what type of exercise? And then, it, it, and, and when? It's, it's, and so that, that's, that's the, the specific. The measurable part is, of course, is that you can, you can then assess progress. And then a, a means achievable, which means that it's not too hard. So if I say we're going to start off with prayer, and I say, you know, uh, my goal is to start off with three hours of prayer per day. You know, unless you actually are a monk or, you know, you're basically retired or, you're, you're, you know, you're not going to have that kind of time and you'll just get discouraged. And then uh, you report back. That's after a while, which is reportable. And then time bound. So there's a time frame. But anyways, so a simple one would be this. I, I'm going to read the Bible for 15 minutes at first rising, 6 a.m., whatever it is for you, every day of 2016. Now, you could even break that down even, you know, you could maybe start off with the first week or a, or, or a month or whatever it is. But smart goals, whether it's prayer, whether it's reading the Bible, whether it's actually getting involved in a small group, these are all important things. Another actual practice that I recommend is journaling, learning journal. I have a learning journal where I just write down things that God is speaking to me, things I do well, things I do poorly, and then I have, I have prayer journals now uh, and learning journals going back almost 15 years. And I go back and I study them. Because sometimes I've got to relearn the lessons that God has actually been speaking to me. And so it doesn't have to be extensive. You know, you can just shorthand, but just you'll be surprised over time what, what God will do for you there. And then finally, you can take a course, Vineyard Bible Institute or at Regent, we've got these great MOOCs which is open source classes that you can actually just register on the Re Regent website and take things for free. But I just want to encourage you as I close. It's just remember, learning and using your mind is a contact sport, but it also requires trial and error. You're not going to be perfect at it. We learn most in our failures and our weaknesses and our adversity. And so no perfectionist. Actually, one of my problems was it was perfectionism. See, actually, perfectionists impede learning because you never stretch yourself. You're always, you know, again, afraid of failing. If you're afraid of failing, you can never really get out of the boat. So we have to learn how to fall forward with grace. And a, and a great example of this was Peter when he denied Jesus three times at, at, right before his, cruci his crucifixion. And, and Jesus said something very curious to Peter after he said he wouldn't deny him three times. He said, you know, you're going to deny me three times. But when after you're done with your time of testing, you're going to encourage your fellow disciples. What Jesus was saying, he didn't even label his denial as failure, but as a learning experience, because Jesus loved Peter and knew the end from the beginning. And what he was saying was, is that each one of you have a calling and a purpose. And learning is part of that and using your mind. And don't get discouraged when you make mistakes and you fail. And Jesus restored Peter there on the banks of the Sea of Galilee. He asked him that famous question, do you love me? Three times. It was just a reinforcement that, you know what, your job is, is, is still there. You're there to lead and feed my sheep. And that's, the, and that's the same prayer I have for you. Just going back to my own situation in life, when I was 18 years old, I, went to, I was a freshman at Penn State. I was studying to be a meteorologist. Uh, I had a very tumultuous childhood, a lot of problems and issues. And the people who hurt me the most were Christians, and so I rebelled against Christianity. I became an atheist, hated God, cursed God. But, uh, and my, you know, my, but you always have to serve somebody. What were my gods? Science 
and hedonism. I like to party. <laughs> so it was really was what it was. That, was. that was the two things, to have a good time. At an orientation session early in my college freshman year, there was, I took this test that detailed what your interests were. And when I got the results, I couldn't believe it. I said, it was said ministry and teaching. <laughs> I said, well, this can't be right. I'm an atheist. I don't like to teach. I'm, you know, more of a shy. I don't, you know, to me, this is, this makes no sense at all. And I forgot about it, actually, until my mom actually reminded me years later about it. And then subsequently what happened was, because of the problems and issues I had, uh, I developed kind of a post-traumatic stress type disorder, anxiety, panic disorder, which I would not you know, wish on my worst enemy. But I now thank God for it. Why? Because it brought me to my knees. It humbled me. Without that, I'm not sure I would have embraced the Lord. Now, like my cat, after all these years, I have come to see God working in it. So in all of our situations, all of our trials, all of our problems, God is still there. And we've got a choice in how we respond. And I now thank the Lord you know, be, for that situation. And I know now that I'm living out Romans 8.28. All things do produce good for those who love God. They're called according to his purposes. And also, too, the suffering that I went through was not in vain. As 2 Corinthians 4.17, for this temporary state of affliction, we have a far more eternal weight of glory. So my prayer is for each and every one of you, as I, as I end, that no matter what you're going through, no matter what problems that you are facing, God wants you to learn a valuable lesson. Because whatever pain or suffering or sorrow you turn over to the Lord, he'll teach you things and how to be able to share that with others. And then there's hope and purpose in your suffering. So let me just end in prayer. And if we get out of our great prayer team, you know, get ready to assemble here as we finish up. And I want to again thank you all for braving the weather, but let's, let's just take this into prayer. And thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. God's grace fills this place. Well, Lord, I, first of all, I want to thank you for the brothers and sisters that you have assembled here today. I thank you, Lord, that you have given us a wonderful and beautiful mind to worship you and to glorify you. And I know, dear Lord, sometimes that the mind that we have is troubled. It's troubled by many things. Sickness, trial, tribulation, loneliness, depression, anxiety. But I thank you, God, that you are a God of hope. That when we learn to understand who you really are and what a good and loving God you are, we can learn to put our trials into a perspective. Just like the Apostle Paul says, that we can have a peace that passes all understanding. And none of us get this right. None of us, completely. That's why we need your grace and your mercy every single day. So my prayer is that, first of all, for those of you who have maybe been like me, who, d who don't know the Lord or rebelling against the Lord or just have been resisting the Lord, I just pray in the name of Jesus that you will surrender like I had to surrender. And I pray in the name of Jesus that you'll pray this prayer. Father, I need your grace. I need your mercy. Just like that servant, I owe you a debt of sin I can never repay. But I want that burden taken away from me. So I confess you as Lord. I confess you as Savior. And I want to learn more about you and your gracious love. And I thank you, Lord, for every single leader and member of this church who models that love. So I pray that as we go out today, we will walk in confidence, just as, as the, the, the song says, that you are the Lord and God of the storm. You are the God of the storm, and you are God of the peaceful sunrise. So I pray, like the Apostle Paul says, a blessing of grace and peace 
upon each and every one of you. In the name of Jesus, amen.